Listeners, thank you so much for tuning into the Shifting Schools podcast. On this episode, sadly, Jeff isn't here, and he is going to be so sad that he missed this conversation because on this week, we are talking again about student leadership, about what it means to really lean into student interests and listen to them, which of course is a huge passion of Jeffs. Let me tell you a little bit about this week's guest. Mike Dolly is a business teacher at Elkhorn Area High School and president of the Wisconsin High School Esports Association. He was a second year teacher when he learned how far PC gaming had come since his younger gaming days when a student gave a presentation on the League of Legends World Championship. Ever since that presentation, his interest in esports has grown exponentially. He started one of the very first state associations that has since grown to over 125 schools around the state. He serves as a board member for the Milwaukee Esports Alliance, serves as a board member for the Interstate Scholastic Esports Alliance, and is constantly trying to push esports to the next level in the state of Wisconsin. So shifted thought for me from this conversation is what are we doing to learn more about the way that play is a bridge for students in building relationships with one another, with coaches and teachers and students, with coaches, teachers, students, and parents and caretakers. Again, how is play that bridge? In what way is it that glue And are we tapping into it as a pathway enough? And now, our conversation with Mike Dolly. So, Mike, in following you just for a short amount of time, one thing becomes just so blatantly clear, and that's what a huge advocate you are for esports in your state of Wisconsin. For an educator who might not be super familiar with esports, and might not understand the many different opportunities and advantages that esports provides to students. Um, can you maybe just talk through some of the ones that you think are really important for educators to understand um, in this world where esports is just growing and growing and growing? What are some of those opportunities and advantages that you see seem to be really impactful for the learners themselves? So I think at the very definition, uh, it's just competitive video games. Um, they've been around for, for decades since all the way back from the 70s with like competitive Pong. Um, it's just now taking on, um, I guess, more of a traditional athletic approach uh, to where we're starting to see the infrastructure being built uh, from scholastic to collegiate to professional now as well. Um, These students aren't just playing video games. They're aligning it to all of our curriculum um, in our schools. We have, like here in my school, I have students that have done graphic design work in order to design our jerseys. They've designed our stream elements. I have an intern that works at the state level for me where she does our like graphics for our match of the week for social media. Um, I have a student that's learning to be a broadcast journalist um, who does the play-by-play commentary for us. Um, He also does his home baseball matches as well for his school. Um, So there's tons of different opportunities that we can use this as a way to align our curriculum in the classroom to give them a limited barrier of entry um, into utilizing and developing real world skills um, that can transition out of the classroom. I think that's the biggest thing that I want to continue pushing forward with this in a lot of school districts is that there actually is not much of a upfront cost. When you compare this to to traditional athletics um, and what we spend on that, uh, I think it's a small drop in the bucket. Um, We also see that statistically speaking, it's like 85 plus percent of our students are gaming in some form or fashion. Um, And this can utilize it in order to make it something that's a positive within the community, can help reach that underserved student population that we look at. 
um, and get students who aren't involved in any other clubs or organizations to participate in some sort of community event within our buildings. And, you know, that has tons of positive effects within our school culture um, across the board. And so it's just, why not? Yeah, you know, the the community building aspect really interests me because I think, again, this conversation about we know how important belonging is for students, feeling like they have connections, they have that opportunity to foster relationships. And you mentioned like the idea of competitive Pong. Um, for my era, you know, I felt like Nintendo was just sort of kind of on the verge. And I look back at my childhood and my brothers and I played tons of Nintendo together. And actually, like, we laugh and joke about, you know, some of that being really, really fond memories and like genuine sibling bonding. Um, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about that connection piece or maybe some of the social emotional learning that you see happening uh, just within within the teams. So I think... And, and not just within the teams, um, between me uh, as a staff member as well and some of those students. Um, I've only been at my school district for three years, uh, but with some of the, the report that I have with students, you would think that I've been here for a decade, like I'm a seasoned person in this room. Um, I'm sometimes the individual that they reach out to with their problems when they're looking for an advocate or if they're seeking advice. Um, I just had one last night that that we were messaging and I was, you know, had them reach out to their counselor because of some of the stuff that they were going through. And it creates that, that connection for me as a staff, which is really important as well. Um, we've had a lot of successes to where students have open enrolled to our school and esports is the thing that gave them that community. It gave them that initial group of friends. Once they were there, they saw, Oh, video games. I'm going to go join that club. Um, so that's been really helpful. I've had some students, too, that, you know, we treat it like varsity athletics in my school. So we do grade checks and attendance checks. Um, sometimes that's me then calling home saying, like, hey, haven't seen little Johnny or Susie for, for a week. Like, we just want to know what's up. We, we have a match coming. We want to know and make sure that their grades are up. And um, it creates just that extra additional level of support here as well. Um, that if they weren't part of our program, they wouldn't be receiving that. They may be one of those that's just kind of slipping through the cracks or mm -hmm. skating by. Um, and now we have that ability to kind of have that formalized process like we do with traditional athletics, which I think is important. Um, we have a, a great group here that they travel to the local colleges and they go play weekly tournaments now together as well. Um, they're usually in our discord, like always talking about like upcoming matches and trying to organize who's driving and who's doing this. Um, so it's really given them something to do even outside of school as they continue to practice throughout the, the summer or off season too. Well, and I'm guessing that's a little bit of a motivator for why, you know, you're so involved in the leadership again, within your state to really seek opportunities for growth in esports and education. Can you talk more about where you see esports going in education, perhaps in the next few years, or you know what what is the growth that you hope to see? Uh, a quote that I saw a, a couple months back is, um, "You have an esports team at your school. You just haven't formalized it yet. <laughs> um, these students are competing in amateur competitions online." They're playing the ranked ladder. You probably have some students in your class that are the upper 1% of all North American players. And there are some of these games that in the North American servers, there's 7 million active users in 30 days. Like, why would you not be celebrating that? If you have a five-star division one recruit for football, everybody's going to know their name, but you're probably not going to know that kid that's top 100 in this game. Um, so you have them. So there's, Again, I, to me, I think every school should have it. Um, obviously, I'm biased, but I can see the, the, the positives that it can make in our school. Uh, it connects different students. It connects different skill sets. It hits those that aren't being reached in, in our normal mediums. Um, and I, I don't think it's unreasonable to think that this isn't there. Now, I will say one thing that really needs to develop in this scholastic scene and hopefully it will with the next generation of teacher that comes through is just the willingness to learn and play some of these games 
Um, we see a lot of in education, we still have a lot of the old guard or the gatekeepers that will not approve of certain titles or they just think video games are inherently evil for our students to participate in. Um, and a lot of changing that perception, I think is important. Um, once we start, like I, I have a student that got a 60% scholarship to go play at a, at a university. He had a majority of his education paid for because of that video game. And there are students like that all around the state and country that they may not get that opportunity to reach the spotlight because somebody just at surface value says video games are bad. Yeah, I'm really glad you brought that up because, you know, when we were putting together this mini series, we were really looking to have an expansive conversation. So one of the guests, Dr. Sarah Cowart, uh, does research around sort of like the moral panic that's been manufactured uh, for decades, right? And what the the research actually says. And your anecdotes about doors that have been opened because of this. Uh, we also, you know, had a great interview with Joni Kraut, who is the CEO of Women in Games International, who, you know, I, I knew the industry was big, but she reminded us, there are even chiropractors that specialize in esports. Like I had never thought about that. And just sort of any industry that exists, there is sort of like a tangent that connects with esports, which um, I, you know, I, again, I don't know that the average person is aware of that. And I'm wondering, so there's knowing what the research says, there's hearing anecdotes like the ones that you have. Um, do you feel like, the, do, do you feel like you're seeing a shift in attitudes, like when you are talking to fellow educators or to parents and, and caretakers about this? Do you feel like in recent years, folks are getting it now? Or do you still feel like there's a big awareness campaign to be had about, uh, to, you know, the benefits of esports? I, I, overall, I say support has grown exponentially with this as well. Um, our late last state championship, we actually had a mom that actually made the sign with like the students' names and like she was like waving the banner. And that's the support that I love to see grow. Um, getting the parents out of there, taking an interest in what their child is, is excelling in. Um, I think that's awesome. Uh, I think as this does continue to expand, there does become more oversight with it. And kind of one interesting element is that when we look at uh, our cybersecurity policies in our school districts, um, needing to make sure that we have read through with a fine tooth comb to read through all that terms of service and to understand, um, you know, who's getting access to this and this and getting that approved through various departments to be on our networks is something that, you know, four years ago, nobody cared that you installed this. Like you needed permission to install it, but now we're like, ooh, what do they have access to? Where is it connected? How is it connected? And and different different things like that. We have one school that wouldn't allow a game because it pings a server in Singapore. And they have a zero tolerance policy for any activity in Singapore. So that game was not approved to be on their network. And three, four years ago, we wouldn't have even have been thinking about something like that. So as this continues to evolve, we're seeing more leadership and admin support, parent support, but we're now starting to see new issues or new barriers starting to arise as we become more knowledgeable in this industry. And I'm guessing that's sort of why it's so useful for you to have the association, the Wisconsin High School Esports Association, which listeners, I'm going to put the link to that website over there in the show notes. Um, it was really interesting for me to explore it and how the association will walk people through the process of how to start a program. So if anybody is listening and is thinking, all right, my curiosity has been sparked, what next? It's amazing guidance. Um, you know, again, as an outsider looking in, it appears as though the association is a really powerful way for students and coaches to network and build that community. Can you talk about that aspect of your work? How Again, students and coaches, you know, that that association is really helping to build bridges and to build connection. Well, and I, I'm going to give a shout out too to all of the other states that do exactly what we do, too. There's uh, 14 other states that have kind of built this together. 
Um, and it's very much just like education to where we have a resource here. Here's how we approached it. And we share those documents with each other. Um, so that way nobody has to reinvent the wheel. Um, we don't keep it behind like a, it's not like a business where it's intellectual property for our success. We want to make sure that all of these other states are, are replicating this model because it's the same thing that our state athletic associations do. Um, they don't compete directly with each other. So why not work together in order to create a better product? Um, and, and we've kind of, I guess, hodgepodge, you know, all of this together over the years, we've learned best practices. We've learned that we have educators that are coming at this from a middle school perspective. We have some that are coming from a library and media specialist position. We have directors of IT that oversee theirs. So being able to create something that is approachable for every single individual that isn't too daunting of a task. How can we make this simplistic for the advocate that's helping students? Because ultimately, these, these students are usually the ones that reach out to me first, and I give them the documentation and say, go find an adult, give them my information, let me schedule a phone call with them, and I will walk them through and hopefully ease a lot of their nerves. And then usually then the next one is like, okay, now go ahead and have your IT individuals reach out to me too. We can handle all of that as well. And it's just more of a, let me help relieve the burden, answer the questions that need to be answered. So that way your program can flourish and your students can participate. Um, and I think with that kind of mentality moving forward, it has been really helpful to a lot of these individuals that aren't game experts. We have some that like, they were there when Pong created. <laughs> um, and, and they're like, I haven't played a video game since, you know, uh, this arcade game came out. Galaga was new or whatever. And so like being able to say like, don't worry. Here's the steps for you as an adult in the room, monitoring students and what you need to do. You don't need to know anything about the game unless you want to learn. Um, and I think taking some of that approach is very important because then all of a sudden they're like, oh, oh, this is doable. Oh, I turns out I do do this in the classroom all the time. It's just managing young adults. Um, and that's that can really be what, what the barrier for entry is. Um, if you want to get to that next level and learn to be an actual, like a game coach or a subject matter expert, then that's something entirely different. That, that takes more time. Um, and that's, again, that's the thing that I would like to see improve in the future. Well, I'm wondering for somebody who is hearing you and they are taking on that message of, okay, I don't necessarily have to have the expertise right now. I can learn it. And also there are networks, there are folks out there who would support me, uh, who are hoping maybe you would demystify what is a practice like as a coach, just like logistically how uniform are your practices? I know you said you approach this as a varsity sport. So, you know, varsity sports, I think many coaches are, are at least have a concept of what that coaching practice looks like or that model. Um, can you say a little bit more about how you approach the design of a practice session? So that's really going to depend from game to game. Um, depending on what the game is, uh, will determine what type of practice strategy that we look at. Um, if I use, say, like uh, MOBA, for example, like so Smite or League of Legends or some that we use uh, that we compete in. For us in Smite, our team was very serious um, and they wanted to win. Um, they fell short the year before and they're like, this. we want to make sure that this is our year. So they were playing together all off season, And when we would come in, we'd have practice on Monday, which meant like we have a little bit of a warm up. We have them play a game and then usually there's a reflection piece to where we sit and we kind of talk about like what went well, what didn't go well. Uh, we try different compositions and just try to say like this worked well, this didn't go well, like we we messed up on this. Awesome. Great. Tuesday, we usually come in and we have kind of like a, um, a draft strategy um, to where we come in and we say like we want to run this, this and this. And or we want to play this character, this character, this character. And so we talk about how we want to go into like picks and bands because um, that's in Smite and League of Legends. 
to where, well, we don't want them to play this because it counteracts this. And we want to play this, so we don't want them to play this. And it's a giant chess move, um, which is my favorite element of MOBAs is the chess match. Because you can win or lose the game right away in draft. Um, and then usually we, we, we try to execute that draft composition in a game, see how it works. And then Wednesday is our normal game. We stream our matches on Twitch. Uh, so then on Thursday, we come back and we have a debrief. We have a VOD review to where we we'll actually go through and we'll look at where a play happened. And we say, was our next move the correct one or was there a more mm. high impact move that we could have made? And so we try to create that situational awareness of we stopped here. We sat and twiddled our thumbs for 10 seconds and we didn't make a play. Like, what could we have gotten in return? What value could we have added to our lead or to help us catch up? Um, and so it's a lot of like reflective talking. Um, for Rocket League, they actually have built in drills into the game, depending on where your students are as far as their skill levels. You can go from like dribbling mechanics to aerial warm ups to like uh, defensive save warm ups. They have all of those kind of built in. You can actually customize and build your own in there as well. Um, Valorant has one to where it's got like a built-in uh, training facility. So where you can warm up on your, your aiming and your muscle memory. Um, there's like different drills that you can run in there too, based upon different characters. Um, so it really depends on which game that you're looking at. Um, we have some other schools that they run, they get creative drills going. Uh, they kind of make their own up. We've had some schools that have reached out to like pro coaches and like, hey, like, how do you have your players warm up? And the coach will be like, here's our drills. Like, here's our warm-up breathing exercises. Here's their their workout routines. Because a lot of the pro teams, they have to go into the gym um, and stay active. Because if you're playing at a high level for 10 hours a day, like, your body needs that exercise because you're sitting prone for so long. So um, there's a lot of resources out there. And there's a lot of people that are willing to give out what they're doing because it creates – Again, it, it builds everybody up in this process as we continue to legitimize. Well, speaking of that generosity, of course, we really appreciate you coming on the show and just, you know, so willingly sharing your expertise and your experience, which we really, really appreciate. Final question. A game that you notice your students are really, really enjoying. So somebody who is listening and, again, is perhaps thinking of, of dipping their toes in uh, what is a game that you think your team might recommend that they really enjoy? It's out of the 40 kids that are participating in our program, Smash is probably the most popular for the Nintendo Switch. Um, I would say our most dedicated group is our Smite team. Um, and that's because, too, that is cross-play. So... If you're on a Switch, an Xbox, a PlayStation, or a PC, you can all play together no matter what you have at home, which is really, really nice. Um, most of the other games are specific to either PC or console, and that could be a, a barrier depending on what your students have access to. Um, I think as long as you come into it with a mentality of just wanting to play, students will flock to whatever your interests are too. Um, my co-advisor across the hall, he does not play PVP games. He does not like to play the esports titles. He likes to play single player co-op games where you're like solving puzzles together. Um, and the kids love to hang out after school on Friday and play those types of games with him because that's, that's what they enjoy together. Um, so I think as long as you're sometimes willing to put yourself out there and, and God, sit down and let them teach you. They will, they will not shut up sometimes. They, they know every intimate detail of these games. And if you give them the opportunity to talk about their passion and what they love, they will not stop. Um, so if you just ask them, like, what do you play? Teach me. They will sit down happily for hours on end. And, uh, and you will be overwhelmed with information, I promise. I could not think of a better note to end on than that one. Um, you know, again, I think that is such a great question for us to be bringing to learners. So thank you so much, Mike, for that reminder. And again, folks, uh, links for you to go check out what Mike is doing, what the Wisconsin High School Esports Association is up to. Just so much great guidance there. 
um, maybe check out his team on Twitch. Thank you so much again for your time today. No problem. Thanks for having me.